Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's a strange standard, but it's what I have. And I don't have it because I thought I should have it. It just came naturally. I didn't choose it. It chose me. Here's my standard. If you want me to be excited about you as a athlete, I need to see you not just excited, but enjoying your sport. Eric Little used to say that when I run, I feel God's pleasure. When I watch a football game, I want to see football players' pleasure. There's a reason why I have been a huge fan of Heinz Ward, the Steelers' uh, wide receiver who I pray one day will end up in the Hall of Fame, as he should. Uh, Super Bowl MVP from Super Bowl uh, 40. Because even with the helmet on, even when he's just blocking, even when things are going badly, he was grinning from ear to ear. Joe Hayden, the defensive back for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who was gracious enough to send me an autographed jersey, uh, falls in the same camp. The guy, his, his smile is so big it looks like it's going to swallow his face. But the first guy, the first guy whose smile drew me to him as an athletic hero is today's subject from heroes you never heard of. Again, I confess some of you will have heard of him if you're uh, close to my age uh, and were uh, paying attention to baseball when you were a kid because I want to talk about Manny Sanguian. Now, when I was six years old, in October of 1971, uh, I had just moved to Western Pennsylvania a few months prior to that, an hour southeast of Pittsburgh. And that October, your Pittsburgh Pirates won the World Series for the first time since 1960, which was the first time they'd won it since 1925. So I paid attention. And I paid attention throughout the 70s. And by the way, the Pittsburgh Pirates won the World Series again in 1979. And both of those seasons, and many seasons, most of the seasons in between, the Pirates' catcher was Manny Sanguian. Now, Manny Sanguian, he loved the game. And he played it that way. I had a jersey. You know, this was back in the day when you couldn't get real jerseys or anything that even looked that real. Uh, this was back in the days as well of the double knit polyester stretchy uniforms. And I had a, you know, kid's copy of that uniform with Manny Sanguin's number 35 on the back. And when I would go through my pre-batting ritual, uh, I would follow his pre-batting ritual. I would dig my toes into the batter's box, stop, lift up one foot, tap tap the foot with my bat, uh, then lift up the other foot, tap the foot with my bat. Now, keep in mind, Manny Sanguian did this to get the dirt out from between his cleats, and I wasn't wearing cleats. I was just wearing tennis shoes. But I wanted to look like him. I wanted to be like him. And it was because he loved the game and he played the game with reckless abandon. I once wrote about him words to this effect that he was such a good catcher 
because he would never let the ball get by him. But he was such a good hitter because he would never let the ball get by him. <laughs> this was not a man given to taking walks. This was not a man who had a discriminatory perspective on pitches. If it was anywhere in the neighborhood, he would swing at it. And he was quite a gifted hitter, uh, topping an uh, average of 300 multiple times during his uh, career with the Pirates making the All-Star game. But all of this is really not why I decided to cover him. I decided to do this segment because he's still a hero to me. I happened to run across his uh, Twitter account. And I sent him a message. I said, Manny, I said, I have a friend who six, seven years ago went to a Pirates fantasy baseball camp. And he knew that you were my favorite pirate from that era. And he played catcher during that fantasy time. And he brought me back an autographed baseball that you had signed. My friend's name is Paul. Uh, do you remember him? And he said, of course I remember Paul. And I remember signing that ball for you. And we became Twitter friends. How cool is that? And Oh, by the way, when baseball's going on... Uh, Manny goes to the pirate games and sits near one of the concession stands just so he can visit with people like me. He's also a Christian man, quick to offer up prayers and praise to Jesus. He still has the same smile that lights up everything around him. I'm grateful for every bit of joy he gave me as a kid. I mean, when I would listen to the pirate games every night on the radio when I was in bed, or if they were on TV and I was allowed to be up, I would watch them on TV. And uh, I don't know, three or four times a year, we'd go to the park and watch ball games there at Three Rivers. And he was my guy. And he still is. More important, he's Jesus's guy. We come now to our second and final look at the sixth commandment in our ongoing series, The Sin Stones. And in our first look, we uh, wrestled with and worked our way through our understanding of what it means to uh, commit murder, the distinction between thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not murder, and how we know what God has to say on that issue. But uh, today I want us to consider uh, the first thing, and we'll do this again with the seventh commandment, uh, but the first thing that Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount uh, to help correct the limitations on the commandment that uh, the Pharisees had established in the culture of the day. You see, the reality is that when you are a legalist, when you are of a mind that takes the view that the way that you have peace with God is by keeping his law, you have the necessary need uh, to diminish the scope of the law because we don't keep the law. So what you have to do is make the law smaller, which means in part that, well, when you start with legalism, you end up in antinomianism. When you start elevating the law as the means by which you're saved, you have to denigrate the law to make it attainable. And so the Pharisees came to this uh, command and reduced its scope down to uh, essentially first degree murder. Now, one of the things that I love about God's law, the whole of God's law, is how brief it is. I uh, sometimes chuckle and sometimes cry when I consider uh, the secular West with its uh, perspective on the Christian faith that it's so full of rules and regulations. And when I consider the fact that uh, all the entire law of God you can carry around in your pocket 
Whereas if you wanted to carry around all the federal laws that exist on the manufacture and use of a stepladder, uh, you'd probably need a forklift just for that. Uh, God's law is small, and God's law is given to us in the context of case law. That is, God lays out principles. He does so through a practical, illustrative way. So that when he says, if your ox gores your neighbor, you do this. If your ox runs away, you do that. It's not just about oxes. It's also about pigs and goats and whatever else. So it is here in the Ten Commandments. These are, these Ten Commandments subsume all of the commandments in the same way that the great commandment subsumes all of the commandments. You can look at it almost like a funnel. The The widest end of the funnel is the whole of the law. The narrowest end of the funnel is the great commandment. And the middle place is the Ten Commandments, but it's all the same law. Well, that tells us, as Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, that the law against murder includes a law against an unjust hatred against our brother. We're not to have that kind of perspective, that kind of attitude toward our brother. And when we do, we break this law. Now, please don't misunderstand this. It is a horrible and dangerous leap in logic to get from the biblical truth that an unjust hatred of your brother is a violation of the Sixth Commandment to the felonious, that's not the right word, erroneous conclusion that uh, hating, hating your brother unjustly is as morally wicked as first-degree murder. By no means. They're both in the same category. But you know, a grape and a pallet full of bananas are both fruits but they're not the same fruits and they're not the same amount of fruits by any stretch of the imagination. So yes, uh, unjust hatred is uh, a violation of this commandment as is first degree murder, but that doesn't make them exactly the same thing. Now, more important than all of that, more important than breaking this down, what Jesus is calling us to do in the Sermon on the Mount is to examine our hearts to look and see where and how we do struggle to not hate our brother, to call us to a love for our brother, because that's the propensity we have. We may have the self-restraint and the self-control and the fear of punishment that will keep us from committing murder, but we might cherish our hatred toward our brother in our heart. And Jesus tells us not only is this a violation of the commandment, but he also wants us to recognize that our Heavenly Father is very much aware of every thought inside our heart, every feeling that we have. So our calling here is to cultivate a love for our brothers. It's a, not just a, a Command a uh, commandment built on uh, commission. Don't commit murder. It's also one of omission, where we're called to not to not fail to cultivate love for our brethren. That's what he calls us to. And by the way, as with every other part of the Ten Commandments, remember that this is an invitation to joy. Learning to love instead of hate your brother is not a burden. It's a blessing. So let's pursue it. I want to let you in on what may or may not be a secret. I know that I know it. I suspect that some of you know it. But I also suspect that there may be some of you who don't know it. Here it is. I'm trying to change you. Did you know that? I'm investing time and energy 
in thinking through the things that we talk about on the podcast, in producing the podcast, in promoting the podcast, in posting the podcast, all of this is done with the hope and the prayer that by the podcast, those who hear it might grow in grace and wisdom. They might increase in their sanctification. They might better reflect the image of Christ. Well, that's a pretty audacious thing for someone to try to do, isn't it? Well, see, here's the thing. If you were to object what, to what I just said, and if you were to, I don't know, create your own podcast or write a blog piece or send me an email or call me up or talk to me face to face and say, my stars, RC, what an audacious thing to claim. You shouldn't do that. You know what you would be doing? You'd be trying to help me. You'd be trying to bless me. You'd be trying to, well... Encourage me on to good works, which is precisely what the Bible calls us all to do. Now, you may reach the conclusion that the only benefit that I bring to you through these podcasts is that I entertain you. Uh, I doubt that's the case because I don't think I'm that entertaining. I'm, I, I probably don't have you rolling in the aisles like a good stand-up comic. Um, but even if I did, I don't think that's why you would be tuning in. I'm guessing that if you've invested the time, even though the podcast is free, it does take time. Just the other day, I got a message on LinkedIn, which, of course, happens on LinkedIn. I got a message on LinkedIn uh, from a fellow saying, hey, uh, I have this uh, slot on this cable channel that goes out to this many millions of people. And uh, if you can produce and get to me a 28 and a half minute program, uh, I can air it for you for free. Hmm. Well, Here's what I have to do with that. I have to figure out a couple things. One, I think, hey, uh, one of the barriers uh, to reaching people via the media of television is the cost of airtime. And and what I'm hearing in this email, whether it's accurate or not, but what I'm hearing is, hey, we just bypassed that barrier. But it's not the only barrier. There's time. There's energy. There's Do I have anything to say for 28 and a half minutes? Do I have the equipment? And will the time and energy that I put into it help enough people to be worth it? Well, in the same way, that's the kind of calculus that goes into our thinking at Dunamis Fellowship with respect to this podcast. I'm not paying for airtime. I do have the equipment to make the podcast, I can distribute it, I can to some degree promote it on social media, which I do, but I still have to ask the question, is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to devote this time and this energy to this project if I'm not helping people? If I'm not participating in our sanctification. Now, the answer to that audacity, by the way, is not just that we all do it. The answer to the audacity is, apart from Jesus, every human who seeks to encourage another human to grow in grace is a fallen human. And I'm one of them too. No question about it. I don't ever want this podcast to be uh, come listen to Jesus changes everything because here's where you're going to get only truth from someone who's only good. Because that's not true. And I'm not good. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But like every other sinner saved by grace, I've been given the charge 
to proclaim that message. And do you understand that's what I'm doing? No matter how far afield our conversation goes, every moment of every podcast comes back to this reality that Jesus died for sinners, of which I am chief. And because of that, our Heavenly Father loves us. Jesus changes everything. And again, this podcast and all that we do at Dunamis Fellowship is designed to be used by Jesus to change you. If you believe that that's happening, and if you believe that's a positive thing, and if you believe it would be a good thing for others to receive that same help, then will you partner with us? First, tell your friends, hey, I'm listening to this program, and it's helping me. It's reminding me. It's not always some brilliant insight that I never thought of. It's often a reminder of something that I knew that I needed to be reminded of. Tell your friends. Pray for us. And if you can, support us financially. Send us a message. All of these things help us assess whether or not we're being used by God. Can you let us hear from you? As always, if the way that we're going to hear from you, if the way that you want to come on board and help out is financially, just go to rcsproljr.com. There's a donate button right there. It's easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Reviews and shares and encouragement and emails, that's all pretty easy too. You can figure that out. Will you, one way or another, come alongside and give us a good word as we continue to hope and to pray that God is using our efforts to bring all things into subjection? You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.